Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Democrats keep the Senate. Hold off a red wave in the House and look forward to a productive lame duck session. <laughs> <laughs> the knives are out for Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy, while Donald Trump gets ready to announce his third presidential campaign. Then the people behind John Fetterman's campaign join us to talk about how they did it, and later, a new game that tests our knowledge about just how crowded the Trump train is right now. All right, let's get to the news. Democrats have retained control of the Senate after Arizona was called for Mark Kelly on Friday and Nevada was called for Catherine Cortez Masto on Saturday. Kelly's leading Blake Masters 51 to 46 percent, not particularly close. And Cortez Masto has squeaked ahead of Adam Lax has squeaked ahead of Adam Laxalt 49 to 48 percent, just about 7,000 votes. Both states are still counting ballots, but almost finished. Democrats now have 50 Senate seats with the chance to win 51 if Senator Raphael Warnock defeats Herschel Walker in Georgia's December 6th runoff. Uh, guys, how big of a deal is this? How much of a surprise is it? And do you have any more thoughts on it? Uh, and do you have any more thoughts on how it happened now that we've all had a few more days to dig through data and just swim through takes? Can you imagine if Blake Masters was one of the 100 people we send to Washington to be in the U.S. Senate? One of the many pieces of color from all of the, the great reporting over the last couple of days about the midterms was how um, the focus group for the first one of the first focus groups for yeah. Blake Masters done by the Republicans yep. um, was one of the worst focus groups they've ever seen in their entire life. And, and he was getting the sort of crudite treatment where people were um, uh, recirculating old videos that he himself had shot, edited and released that just showed how weird he was. One of them was him <clears throat> in a random field shooting a German pistol with a silencer on it. It looked like the ending scene in seven. It was yeah. very off putting. When you when you call the Unabomber an underappreciated thinker and yeah. say that you want to privatize Social Security, mm, mm, not the best. It's a tough one. Yeah. It's a tough, tough. Yeah, uh, well, sending uh, emails to his vegetable co-op, telling him why <laughs> democracy isn't so hot. The guy's been a kook his whole fucking life, just spindly, spindly and fascist. And also Adam Laxalt, by the way, because you know we've spent a lot of time on Blake Masters and Oz and Herschel Walker, and Adam Laxalt has just kind of gone under the radar. But he's a terrible candidate. Yeah. <laughs> also, like, embrace the big lie, election denier. He wasn't as splashy. Wasn't as splashy. He wasn't as splashy in his embrace of uh, election denialism. But, but Dan was, right. was there he was, nonetheless. He was the Conor Roy of Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> no, but John, John Ralston, who's the, the dean of the Nevada Press Corps, talked about how Laxalt was a terrible candidate as well. Just nobody saw him because they did let him out of his little candidate cage in the uh, media. And Ralston took some shit. For being uh, too Pollyanna-ish about Democrats by saying that he believed uh, Masto would hold on and that Democrats would win two out of the three seats in contention, uh, and actually won all three seats. All three yeah. seats. Yeah, he got it right. He was right about the governor's race too. Uh, Steve Sisolak, the governor, the Democratic governor of Nevada, is the only Democratic incumbent governor uh, in the country that that lost. You know, I was, um, I think, like by constitution, when I see everybody. Uh, in a state of despair, it's my instinct to be like, all right, you're everybody chill out. Like there's here's some things that we should be considering and not losing our heads. And I have the same thing when I see Democrats rejoicing and I see all this celebration thing. Hold on a second. All right. Like we have uh, we we lose the House, which means we lose the ability uh, to legislate in the same way. Uh, the Senate map in 2024 is pretty tough. Like, let's all not act as though all of our problems are solved. We have a lot of hard things ahead. But what I was thinking over the weekend was. Imagine the three of us doing this pod right now with election deniers in charge of key election infrastructure in Wisconsin, in Arizona, in Nevada, in Pennsylvania, and us trying to come up with some godforsaken reason they should people should still try. Yeah, America, spare a thought for us. No, for but the I'm just three of us. But like the fact that no, I don't mean it because of us. I mean first, they, I'll take down this straw stop. man over here. No, no, shut up. Then you shut shall, the fuck who up. Shall think of shut the podcasters. Shut the fuck up. I wasn't saying thinking of us. I was thinking of all like how how bad a situation it would be in to try to make an argument for why we're going to still have this fight left in us. And actually, we we stopped all these fucking Look, people. Yeah, it would have been harder. Here's the truth. You know, in 18, expectations got out of control. The blue wave was supposed to win us the Senate. Didn't happen. In 20, Joe Biden was ahead by 10 points in Wisconsin. It was close. This one, it was the red wave. It was close. The thing is, we were a few thousand votes in a couple states away from that. Of course. <laughs> That's why of course. It was once again super close. We are once again on a, we are on a knife's edge of this country. Thank you, Harry Reid. I know you can't hear me because you're dead. That, that was the joke that I was making on Twitter that people didn't necessarily get. Oh, now he's shadowboxing some Menchies. I am. 
<laughs> it's unbelievable. So, there's nothing more annoying on social media than when you make a joke and people don't get it and then they make fun of you and you're anyway. But Harry Reid built a political ge- machine in Nevada that is so powerful that it exists years after his death. It's really impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, so if Warnock and Lisa Murkowski win, because uh, they have ranked choice voting in Alaska, so we're still waiting on the outcome there, it'll be the first time in over 100 years that no incumbent senator running for re-election lost. How, isn't that nuts? It is. And it does <laughs> go to the larger, like, you know, there's um, J- Joe Biden's doing some kind of a victory lap. I think around the dip room. Uh, <laughs> no, he's in like uh, Bali. Oh yeah, he's yeah. Right. He's, he's, in, he's wearing he's in, silly shirts and yeah, he's wearing silly shirts. He's looking Aussie around. He's thing. talking to she, she. Uh, but um, uh, you look at like the kind of the number of people that were dissatisfied with Joe Biden's job performance, but still voting for the Democrats, and it is like a lot of people went into that booth or looked at that piece of paper and were like, "I'm in a really pissed off mood." But I cannot support these people. I yeah. just can't do it. I cannot extreme. bring myself to do it. It's it, it's it. When I think back to the wilderness focus groups, it's like they would complain for an hour about Joe Biden, Democrats, inflation, crime, all the stuff that the media was talking about that everyone's mad at the media for having talked about. And then at the end, it'd be like, "So you're gonna? But would you vote for Herschel Walker?" And like, oh no, he's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and Sarah Longwell was just saying that the New York Same Times. Same thing about Blake Masters. Same thing about Blake Masters. And at the end of the day, these can- the candidates that the Republicans ran. I mean, people are talking a lot about how it was democracy. It was democracy, but it was, you know, in the sense that they would embrace the big lie. That made them too extreme, that they would want to criminalize all abortions. That made them extreme. Sometimes it was just Blake Masters saying things like the Unabomber is an underappreciated thinker. That makes them extreme. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like, it was a whole bunch of things that made them just completely unfit for public office. And I do think there's a there was a kind of vicious circle in the rhetoric that they were using in their own information bubble around not just abortion, but around trans issues, around gay issues uh, that just didn't comport with people's reality, trying to scare people about what was happening in schools. It just didn't reflect the experiences people were having. And that also weren't on the anywhere near the list of the top issues on people's minds. Yeah. That that I think is like whether or not somebody's going into the whether someone's going to vote for or against someone based on on some of these issues, we don't know. But I do think there are some ways in which someone will say something completely unhinged and it's a signal to you. They're like, oh, this is a, this person's this person's yeah. out to lunch. I think if if you look at what Democratic candidates who won tough competitive races did, they basically did four things. They um, went on offense on abortion and Republican extremism. They drew contrasts with their opponents on economic populism. Uh, you know, they said they didn't have a plan for inflation or their plan for inflation is to cut taxes for rich people and gut health care. And we've been fighting for the middle class over the last year. This is what we've accomplished. They dealt with crime attacks by reiterating their support for law enforcement and gun control. And then they talked about their bipartisan credentials while pointing out that their Republican candidate was extreme. Like, and, and almost every single Democrat that won did all of those things in their ads and their speeches and how they made news. Um, what kind of impact will a Democratic Senate have? Enorm- it'd be an enormous one for Joe Biden's agenda, for us, for the, our ability to confirm judges. Um, the biggest thing we'll be able to get judges through. You also, um, if we get, well, you want to do 50 51 later, or should we do it all right now? Let's do it. Uh, we can do it all right now. I mean, if we can get 51 votes in the Senate, then. Uh, we will have the majority on committees, mm. which means you can vote nominees out of committee and not have to take everything to the floor, which will speed up the whole process of moving legislation. Uh, you could imagine scenarios where, I don't know, we'll see what happens in the House. It's pretty close. You could see a scenario where you have a weak speaker. There are votes that are bipartisan. You have Republican House members who want to work with Democrats on discrete issues. The right? fact that Democrats can hold control what happens on the Senate floor yeah. will be a very big deal in some if we're trying to figure out how to get a a budget or some kind of must pass thing out yeah. of both chambers. It means there will not be impeachment trials. The the House can do whatever they want, that the Senate will not take up will not hold the won't hold the yeah. trial. Don't they have to hold the trial? I think that they I think they, they, they won't make they, it easy. But they have to hold the trial. They hold, can't they They can do it in a kind of pro- Wait, they have to hold the trial, but, it, the but tri- it doesn't have to look like the trial. Right, the trial can... that the trial that Schumer would hold would look very different that's than what McConnell. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. All right, yeah, but, but to Tommy's point, there are eighty seven judicial vacancies right now. In the country, there are 58 Biden nominees awaiting a hearing or a vote. So the judicial 
uh, outcome is that's the that's the biggest impact, especially Enormous. if we end up not winning the House here. Um, then there's a question of like if there's a Supreme Court uh, opening, we could uh, fill it. Um, there's also been some question, you know, Sonia Sotomayor is 68 years old. She would be 74 in 2028 uh, if we lose either the presidency or the Senate in 2024. So possible retirement there. Mm -hmm. Sam Alito, 72. Clarence Thomas, 74. So the Supreme Court thing could be in play over Clarence the next Thomas has been in our lives for a thousand years. I know. 74. And he's still only, it's only, like only 74. 74. It feels also, like he's a thousand. How is that possible? possible? Like, Ginny Thomas doesn't do anything halfway. <laughs> you know, she was in that cult. Now she's like gone full Q. She's always like, one charismatic scuba instructor out of four seasons away from putting Clarence Thomas's life at great personal risk. Like she can be convinced to do skydiving, spelunking, bungee jumping. Like she is a persuadable voter on a number of key issues. Uh, so that's something Wait, to keep in mind. Play play this out. Are you, are you saying that they yeah. just like extreme sports, or she's going to leave him for the scuba? No, Steve, no. Or... I'm just I'm saying that like if a a, a well placed a well placed uh, a person at a White Lotus like resort okay. for conservatives mm -hmm. suggests uh, you know that hang glide, you know that thing where they they people jump like flying squirrels. Yeah, yeah, yeah squirrel suits. I think that she could be persuaded to do that and maybe bring <laughs> Clarence along. All I'm saying is huh. Clarence may not be there. Wow. Yeah. And if, if things go a certain way, another point I'd like to make about why 50, two points about why 51 is better than 50. Uh, again, there's going to be a very tough Senate map in 2024. And also, they're all a thousand years old. And we never get to the, this uh, two year term in the House and Senate is like, the Oregon Trail. You don't end up with everybody at the end. A lot of dysentery. Yeah, people fall by the fucking wayside. <laughs> these are uh, these people are a thousand years old. Patrick Leahy he falls down the stairs twice a week. Oh my god. <laughs> well, he's not going to stick around anyway. The tw I want to go back to your point about the twenty twenty four map. They're old. The twenty twenty four map is important. God makes openings. <laughs> there is, there is now almost zero chance the Republicans can get a filibuster-proof majority in 2024. Yeah. Which you might be thinking, oh no, that was there was a chance. It was. Yes, there was. There, there we was. lost a couple of these. It was the be pretty close. Is brutal, brutal in 2024. So we will be defending Democratic incumbents in uh, three Trump states: West Virginia, Montana, and Ohio, and then uh, defending incumbents in purple Biden states: Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nevada. Our best pickup opportunities, our best possible flips in 2024 are Florida and Texas. You might be saying those aren't very promising. Uh, well, those are the only possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're going to be all encouraging everybody to go knock on doors for Kirsten Cinema. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> yeah, we'll get you there. <laughs> 51 maybe votes. Ruben Gallego, maybe. Yeah, hey, the hey, primary. Primary. Yeah. maybe she can get her to be uh, some, some, some cabinet position. Yeah. 51 takes it out of the, takes the balance of power out of the, the capricious coal dust covered hands of Joe Manchin and or Kristen Sinema puts it in yeah, Kristen Sinema's well, right, hands yeah, which right, listen right. I think I'd rather slightly more liberal hands they both well the thing is it's like it's it's a double edged sword right because the two of them have stuck together because neither one of them wanted to be the one to right, sink yeah, right, right. Uh, uh, any kind of votes but also, I think I still think that there's a they can make they can make 51 look a lot like 50 or they can they can decide they can split off on things. Also, if if, you know, Joe Manchin is facing an incredibly tough reelection in 2024 in West Virginia, if he decides he's going to like go be an independent <laughs> yeah. or or switch or something, then 51 uh, helps with that. Um, and also. Uh, I saw someone point out Kamala Harris doesn't have to be in D.C. anymore to cast tie-breaking votes so she can spend more time in other places. <laughs> That's good. Campaigning. Get on the road. road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Also, everyone's like, oh, all the things that will happen in the Senate if we have 51. How about just like we have Raphael Warnock instead of Herschel Walker? We have like a brilliant, inspiring preacher instead of a fucking stone cold moron <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who that's... like who like put a gun to his ex wife's head. That's that's a that's a bonus right there. Yeah, it just seems wrong for him to win. Uh, ugh. Uh, how do you think the fact that control of the Senate has already been decided um, should impact Warnock's strategy in this runoff that's uh, that's happening on December sixth? I doubt it does. I mean, don't you assume that Warnock's People have been running this race the whole time, assuming they had another month and that they're just going to kind of execute on that. I mean, look, yeah. if I were them, I'd take some cash. I would maybe buy a Mar-a-Lago membership and see if I could talk Trump into coming down to Georgia for a few stops. <laughs> I mean, that's an opportunity. Yeah. I do think given that the stakes are not control of the Senate, it makes it more about character qualifications record. It makes it more about which man do you want to represent you, and it makes it a much, much harder road for the Republicans. And, and I think that's the strategy for that sure. Warnock follows because his first ad 
um, and for the runoff was all about character. And it said, this whole thing is about character. Who do you want? And I think it's easier to do that when Senate stakes are. It's it. just harder for the Republicans to motivate people, I think. I mean, I think you could get a lot of these voters out again to say, keep own the libs, keep them out of power, vote Herschel Walker. No one's turning out you for Herschel Walker. You gotta get in yeah. your car and drive again to vote just for this. Make I, a plan of it. I did see that Kemp is now going to campaign with Walker, and he didn't before, probably because he was worried about his own election. Yeah. And like the Senate Leadership Fund, like uh, they're going to lend their dad in some money. So like they're they're all they're getting behind. Try. They're all going to try. But um, but are we'll their see. hearts going to be? In which it? is why everyone should. Which is why we all need to sort of get involved and uh, and and uh, send money down there and help when whatever we can because uh, we don't want Herschel Walker in the Senate. No. And Raphael Warnock is bad. one of the best senators we have. So. Yeah. Um, one more fun thing before we move on to the House. Uh, the Republican infighting over losing the Senate mm. has begun. Uh, Mitch McConnell's flunkies are blaming Rick Scott's flunkies. Rick Scott's flunkies are blaming Mitch McConnell's flunkies. And at least five Republican senators, including Scott, have called for a delay in leadership elections. What do you guys think? Is Mitch in trouble? Here's what I want to say. And who are we rooting for? Here's what I want to say. Who are we it's rooting aliens for? aliens versus predator. Whoever wins, we lose. The, the, <laughs> the, I see the points that Rick Scott is making. They're great points. <laughs> I see what McConnell is saying about the Trump people. They're making great points. Honestly, some of the points Trump's making, not so bad. The thing is, they're all responsible and, and they're all trying to make this about the decisions they made in the last year. Because that's a place where they can find dissensus and maybe places where they can find some purchase to make an argument for why it's not their fault, it's someone else's fault. This is the culmination of years of years of getting exactly what they fucking wanted. They wanted to overturn Dobbs and they got fucking killed for it. They wanted all the enthusiasm and excitement that came mm. from the Trump base and then they got fucking punished for it. All of these people got exactly what they wanted, which is exactly what they deserved. And they and, and have at it. Blame each other, tear each other down. You're all full of shit. That's how I feel about that. I'm obviously rooting for Rick Scott here. I am too. Well, of I course, mean, he's because he's an I idiot. Mean, who, <laughs> he's tele, a, he's tele, a Medicare thief. Telegenic, uh, br brilliant policy mind. <laughs> um, just expert recruiting. That guy is fuck. We is know the what best. Mitch McConnell is capable of. He's an obstructionist and he can raise a lot of lobbyist money. I would love to see Rick Scott take the reins here. He's one of the most personally unappealing, <laughs> politically tone deaf, personally damaged, corrupt goons in that entire city. Yeah. Go for it. Sure. I, look, let's not. It's not like Mitch McConnell is 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 like George Clooney, right? Like he's not exactly personable or like well, a, another, a great another, another straw man gunned down on the. <laughs> I said I know what he's or, good at. Do you want to? He's a good obstructionist and he more, raises money. Any more That's all he's Twitter good at. mentions you want to argue with? Yes. I don't want anyone to tell me uh, whatever happened to when they go low, we go high. Hey, this is I Republican never said that. I never not said our, that. All I'm fighting. saying is, I think some look, Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell, minority leaders often look like geniuses. It's not, it's easier to obstruct when you're in the minority in the Senate. Uh, he has benefited from a lot of decisions a lot of other people have made. I'm not saying Mitch McConnell isn't a smarter and better yeah. politician than Rick Scott, but I'm like a little bit done with the like Mitch McConnell strategic genius. The, thing. Was the Washington Post has like a, an extremely long story that is very good about everything that happened in the last year with Republicans or two years, whatever it was. And there was just one great moment where they're like, at one point, uh, McConnell's people blamed Scott and his people for the plan to cut Medicare and Social Security and every other government program after five years and also raise taxes on working people. But then Scott blamed McConnell for letting Lindsey Graham do the 15 week abortion ban. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, which goes to your yeah, point. Good which point. Is like, there's just plenty of point. plenty of dumb ideas to go around. I, I will, there are. I will. Yes, I will. I will. I will pause and say the Rick Scott Sunset Medicare Medicaid raise taxes on half of taxpayers plan is Excellent. one of the greatest <laughs> unforced errors in my entire life of paying attention to there politics. There was absolutely no need he for it. He drove 300 miles to step on a rake. It like, was completely unnecessary. Uh, if you yeah. look at the amount the Democrats spent on ads, abortion, obviously number one, as we've talked about before. But right after that, Ads about Medicare, ads about Social Security. Ads about, it wasn't in the headlines. It wasn't no. being covered by the media, but it was Democrats were hitting that message. Those were hard. all the big, like the clips of Obama on the road that were yeah. going around was all those sorts of hits. Absolutely. And, and, and also like Mitch McConnell is in this mess because he and his flunkies realize that Trump is the problem, but they are all too weak to take they're him. They're cowards. It's not, Complete yeah, cowards. They, it's not just Weakness. that they're cowards. It's they like, where is the enthusiasm 
for other like you can maybe point to Ron DeSantis. They have not just they didn't just concede the kind of party to Trump like. They have been relying on the enthusiasm and excitement and yeah. like engagement that Trump generates. They have really outsourced the kind of grassroots part mm -hmm. of politics to Trump as a person. And they're kind of shit out of luck. Yeah. And, and you know what he does? Uh, that deal with the devil gets you emails from Trump that are ostensibly about raising money for uh, the Warnock campaign or the, the Walker campaign, where it actually splits the thing nine to one yeah. favor of money to Trump versus money for the candidates. But the McConnell people, I have no sympathy for them because they could have voted to impeach Donald Trump and, and taken this off the table to some extent. They were worried that he would leave the party and do his own third party sort of new MAGA party thing. And they were afraid of him. And that cowardice and that weakness is what got us here. Yeah, I'd also, yeah, I mean, this this you know look you can try to burn down the capital and you can insult and degrade every institution and aspect of our political life don't you lose but us but don't the lose us a mid <laughs> don't yeah. now, look i mean now you're costing us seats that's a sin we can't abide now as much as i would love rick scott to to uh take over for mitch mcconnell i did look at the uh at the senate republican caucus page and looked at all those pictures i could only count about 10 true yahoos <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that would back that might back scott over mcconnell like there's too many sort of s establishment cucks there who are just mcconnell <laughs> there's <laughs> McConnell um people. there's a delay caucus which is like cruz rubio holly rick scott yeah. wait well the, the the argument is let herschel walker this is what they want get elected then we should have a vote i think that's also supported by right-wing organizations like the heritage foundation and yeah. club for growth but you're right it that is gets a very you like fringe. 11 12, yeah it's still hard to get it's, right up wing. To, it's still hard to get yeah. the number you need to, to oust McConnell. Um, well, let's talk about the House. Uh, so Democrats' path to keeping a 218-seat majority is incredibly narrow right now. Uh, Dave Wasserman of the Cook Political Report says that Republicans have won or will probably win in 220 districts. For Democrats, it's 213, and two seats are still toss-ups. Um, either way, this will be the smallest number of House seats lost by the party in power in 20 years. Even though the overall House vote is so far eight points more Republican than it was in 2020, that number could come down a bit as um, as California gets counted, but probably not a ton. Any more thoughts on why that is or how we got here in the House? Not especially. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, couldn't put it better than that. I mean, just <laughs> to give it a whirl. Uh, Thanks, Tommy. Uh, I think some bad candidates cost them. Uh, a notable one, like John Gibbs in Michigan, mm. completely wackadoodle out there candidate. Um, clearly, the concerns about Republican extremism outweighed anger at Biden or the economy. I think we hurt. We were greatly damaged uh, in our efforts to keep the House by the Republican gerrymander in Florida. I think the Republicans got four seats out of Florida. Yeah. Didn't help that we uh, nominated a completely warmed over, uninspiring gubernatorial nominee against Ron DeSantis, and he just mopped up. Um, you contrast that with Ohio, right, where Tim Ryan lost to J.D. Vance but helped flip House seats. We talked about New York last week and how we didn't you can, do well there. Yeah, I mean, look, we'll, you can put together a Democratic majority by just undoing the gerrymander in Florida, a couple other southern states, a better map in New York, a better map in Wisconsin. Uh, uh, just the fact that Salt Lake City is divided instead of being a district. There are places all across the country you can look and find, yeah. um, find the find the find the gerrymander uh, to to lose. Um, Cook Political says Democrats won 100 percent of solid D seats. Likely D seats and lean D seats, 100% of all of those. 69% of toss ups, nice. And a one lean R. That was the other um, very extreme candidate, uh, Joe Kent in Washington. The guy, I was, that guy's bonkers. Bonkers. And that, really was, another, that radar, was another Trump thing guy. because Jamie Herrera Butler mm -hmm. was a Republican who <clears throat> voted to impeach Trump. The party ousted her because, you know, you can't be impeaching Trump in that party anymore. Joe Kent won the nomination. They thought it was still going to be safe. They, lost yeah there there are um there are a few places i mean one reason you will see democrats winning all the places that lean democrat is because if they are places that lean democrat they were not gerrymandered and these republican gerrymanders are so strong 
that it makes it possible if you just like basically they got a little greedy here and there. Mm. And there's a couple seats we're picking off because they got a little greedy in their gerrymanders. Yeah. And then the other reason you had that gap between the swing for the House vote and how many seats Republicans picked up is um, there was real low turnout in safe Democratic seats. And then there were more sense. contested Republican races. That makes sense. Um, so, um, so the Wall Street Journal reported that um, right-wing Representative Andy Biggs of Arizona will challenge Kevin McCarthy for Speaker. Uh, there's a vote today where McCarthy only needs a majority of House Republicans, which he'll get. But Biggs wants to show that McCarthy does not yet have the 218 votes he'll need when the House convenes in January. Uh, what do you guys think? Is McCarthy in trouble? This is a hard one. It, it's I don't know. It, it's hard to see how this thing shakes out. Uh, there was reporting that McCarthy called uh, Henry Cuellar to see if he can get him to flip. Did, really? Yeah, it didn't work. It didn't <laughs> work. I've been saying, not our Henry. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you got Matt Cates running around proposing every fucking numbskull. Oh, can, we, can we listen? To, we, I think we have the Matt G Gates clip, which we have to play. I've heard the name Tulsi Gabbard, someone who might actually bring us a few folks from the left who are tired of the corrupt ruling class in of uh, this town. Right now, there are a lot of the establishment Republicans in denial, believing that Kevin McCarthy can somehow still become speaker. What I'm here to tell you is there are definitely at least five people, actually a lot more than that, who would rather be waterboarded by Liz Cheney than vote for Kevin McCarthy for Speaker of the House. And I'm one of them. So one thing I just want to point out is that like who waterboards you doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's more the process. It's the experience. Yeah. So yeah. it's a weird thing because he's done. He makes comments like this in the past and it well, always ends up having a kind of vaguely sadomasochistic sexual it, element. Do you That's think all a, I wanted to point out. Do you think down. a Cheney could have some expertise that others don't possess? Does that make it it's like, like worse? What, they are like or better the, or worse? <laughs> the founding fathers yeah. of. Also, by the way, mm. good for Liz Cheney. You know what? Good for Liz Cheney. She she uh she stuck her neck out. She campaigned with Alyssa Slotkin. Yeah. She you know what? Good for her. Um, on this Tulsi Gabbard thing, I think I saw that Adam Laxalt was the eighth loss out of the twelve Republicans endorsed by Tulsi Gabbard in her little uh, tour where she pretended that she was suddenly leaving the Democratic Party for reasons other than her being just a completely weird person. Yeah. I think if Carrie Lake loses, mm -hmm. Tulsi will lose her ninth endorsement. So let's not pretend that anyone cares what she thinks or says. No, I don't think so. So like if if Republicans end up, if House Republicans end up with 2019 or, or 20, uh, 219 or uh, 220 seats, that's only like, they can only spare one or two defections, Kevin McCarthy. So that's on the like, he could be in trouble side. On the other side, like, you can't beat something with nothing. Any kind of challenger would also need 218 and only could spare a defection or two. Apparently, Donald Trump is telling people to back McCarthy. Uh, one Trump advisor said to CNN, the strategy is to protect McCarthy from blame because Trump needs him for his presidential run. So, a, so Trump's hmm. trying to use McCarthy here. And then wow. apparently Marjorie Taylor Greene went on uh, Tommy's favorite podcast, yeah, Bannon, yeah. Bannon's War Room, and she said it would be she a him. bad strategy to challenge Kevin McCarthy. I mean, Kevin has to get 218 votes. The question becomes what concessions you make along the way to get there. The Some of the House Freedom Caucus members were pushing for a rule change that would make it possible for any member at any time to call a vote to depose the awesome. speaker. Uh, endorse. Right. Endorse. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> in practice, it just means, you know, Kevin's going to spend the next couple months sucking up to dudes with names like Chip Roy. You know what I mean? But, like, he might get there. There's no Random, uh, various QAnon supporters. Yeah, there's yeah. no alternative. But there are, are what will these chaos, these right wing chaos agents be willing to take in terms of heat from the kind of serious uh, adjacent people that are telling them to just go along with Kevin McCarthy? Like, how long can this go? How much can they drag out? How long can we go without a speaker before they kind of relent? I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know. Also, I, I, I think this is a little bit wishful. Mm -hmm. I can also see this coming together pretty quick. Yeah. But in my but in the but in the but in the part that wishes. The same candle I lit before the election, let it drag out, let it go on. <laughs> but I on. do think if it does come together for McCarthy, um, he's still going to have a just a, a, a really tough time. It's like a hard job. back to the Im impeachment conversation, I don't know that there will be an impeachment with that size of caucus because you need three you need people, everyone on board. It. You have a couple people on board, and again. These people, like, it, there's a very real shot that Democrats retake the House in 2024. Uh, we we lost five seats in New York that Joe Biden won by four points or more in 2020. So, like, there's a real chance Democrats retake the House in 2024. So there's a bunch of Republicans sitting in districts that are pretty competitive. Like, do you really think 
going forward with the impeachment of Joe Biden is the best move here? I don't I don't right. know. Right. They if don't want to. And if they would have if let's say they'd gotten their 30 or 40 seats, nobody wants to be part of the 10 to 20 that defect for something that passes. Yeah. But to be the 10 to 20 <laughs> that just stops something from happening. Yeah feels much more palatable. Yeah, the hard thing is that the hard right base of the party, the kind of TP USA kind of goobers are all going, they're very mad at McCarthy to begin with, and they were all are going to be demanding blood. They want to own the libs. That's all they care about, yeah. right? They want Hunter Biden investigations, which could still happen in a Republican House, and they want and will impeachment. Uh, yeah, they absolutely will happen. Fauci in jail. They want Right. Yeah. So like that, how Kevin- I Head back to the Wuhan lab. Yeah, how Kevin balances- <laughs> Him wanting the title of speaker with the demands of the genuinely crazy people like Paul Gosar within his caucus is going to be, I don't know how you do that. Yeah, like, I mean, look, I, I, the same dynamic, this is why it's like this, you know, there was like a weekend of Trump's toast. Okay. The, the same dynamic is at play, which is a lot of Republicans, whether they said it out loud or not, believed that election denial was a losing issue. A lot of them believed that abortion mm -hmm. was a lo losing issue. A lot of them believed these kooks were going to cost them them races and seats. They thought maybe the wave would be big enough to overcome it. But now we've been given this proof point. OK, we've now seen it. These are losing issues. They still have to do the hard work of that like base to leader to base to leader and back and forth conversation where a major a big group of people that are supposed to be the adults start signaling down that we're not doing this anymore. But they're all afraid to do that still. Kevin McCarthy cannot do that now. So for all the talk about how uh, uh, they've learned their lesson, they can only that is only true if over the next six months to a year they start the hard work of like basically like trying to <laughs> civilize the base that they've let go rabid I, over the last 30 years. And I, and I don't believe it's going to happen. And I think you need a party leader to do that. I think Donald Trump could do that. He mm -hmm. could tell the base to chill out if he wanted to. Ron DeSantis did do it to a small extent in Florida, I right? I was just going to say when, that. When they, were going, when they were screaming for him to pass a six-week abortion ban, he said no and stuck at 15 weeks, which was one of those moments where you're like, ah, this guy actually has some political instincts that are smart that Trump does not. Yeah, before we get too excited that they're not going to be able to pull this together, like Ron DeSantis, Greg Abbott, um, some of these red states did not, like they were able to deal with the headwinds from abortion bans, extremism, mm -hmm. threats to democracy, which weren't popular in their states and these governors won anyway. So, um, but if Donald Trump's leading the party, that's going to be tough. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. So we still have a few months before the new Congress is seated. Um, and there's a, a long list of things uh, to get done in what's known as a lame duck session of Congress. Uh, Nancy Pelosi said she wants to lift the debt ceiling. The Senate announced they'll be voting to codify same-sex marriage protections. Uh, there's also the Electoral Count Reform Act, government funding debates. Uh, what do you guys think is most realistic and important here in this list? Because really, there's not a lot of time. The single most important thing that they can do is uh, raise, ideally eliminate, the debt ceiling. There's nothing more important that they can do in this period of time. Ideally, they could scrap it forever. I don't know that that's possible. It seems like a like maybe too uh, hard a road to hoe. But look at what is happening in the House right now. It is a dust cloud of right wing arms and legs. They don't know. <laughs> they don't know what they're going to do to stop the country from going into default. You cannot rely on this group of people. You know. Uh, uh, Schumer today, Schumer, Pelosi, they both said they want to do something about the debt ceiling. Manchin today kind of echoed what has been a party line, which it should be bipartisan. Anita Dunn said that Anita over Dunn. the weekend as well. That's just what you say. Obviously, like <laughs> whatever concessions or deal you need to make with a few Republicans in the Senate right now is far better than taking the country to the precipice with a Republican House that has already said they will use the debt ceiling to get concessions on social safety net and taxes. They are telling you they're going to hold a gun to the country's head already. Don't wait for them to do it. Yeah. And on the because I saw people freaking out over Manchin saying it should be bipartisan. The reason the Democrats for a long time, and I think it's back to the Obama administration, would say, oh, it should be bipartisan is what they mean is one party shouldn't use it to wring concessions to policy concessions out of the other party. Mm -hmm. So it should be. If Manchin changes to, oh, it must be bipartisan or else I'm not going to do it, then we're all fucked. <laughs> yeah, I don't like, look, yeah. people like Romney and others are looking at this and they don't want to put exactly. the country through it either. This is where the business interests will lobby against it as well. This is where That's traditional true. Republicans <laughs> have a little swat. They're also going to have to pass some, some must pass spending bills or else we're going to go into a government shutdown in mid December. Which, by the way, I don't, I'm, I'm wondering if they're just going to, they, they need to do a couple spending bills. 
it, you can do the debt ceiling without a not having to do a, deal with the filibuster if you do a budget resolution because that only needs 50 votes. So why don't you do a budget resolution that funds the government and everything else, all those other priorities, and then just tack the debt limit on there and just do it all at once. The debt ceiling is like um, if you were trying to cut your credit card spending. Mm -hmm. And so you took a picture of yourself in full Nazi regalia. And you set an auto send on your email mm -hmm. to go to every one of your contacts <laughs> okay. if you ever hit your limit. Okay. But it doesn't stop you from spending money on the credit card. You just keep ra raising your credit card limit. Yeah. And you risk sending that picture. I think this just delete in the, the photo. The Nexium documentary I'm watching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just don't. This is don't do it. All right. So we need the debt. So the debt ceiling we can do if we get Mansion and Cinema on board. Yeah, I, that's I'm, good idea. That's <laughs> let's, let's do that. <laughs> that's that's what it comes idea. down to. Um, I think uh, it sounds like from all the reporting today that same-sex marriage protections will pass. The Respect for Marriage Act. Yeah, I'm very happy. Uh, Tammy Baldwin was insistent that it wasn't a political message bill. It was actually a bill to protect marriage equality. For me, it was a political message bill, so pass it. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it passed the House with 47 Republican Great. votes. So, I think, I think the, um, the Electoral Count Reform Act is in very good shape as well. Uh, yeah. And we've talked about that before. I think they have like 30 co-sponsors, including Mitch McConnell. Um, it would clarify the vice president's role. It would basically put the judiciary in charge of state certification or at least as a backstop for state certification so that people in state legislatures and governors mm -hmm. couldn't just overturn the election with no judicial review, um, which is very important. And then it would raise the threshold in Congress to objecting to any uh, electoral result. Yeah, let's I, do that. I do think it was a bit untoward yeah. to include as a concession to some of the more conservative members of the House that we will hang Mike Pence <laughs> to get it done. It's in there. Leave him alone. He's on a book tour. Look, people don't read these bills. They didn't know you couldn't vote on Saturday before the Georgia runoff. They don't know that this yeah. electoral count act will kill Mike Pence. <laughs> There's some talk. He'll be of... hung to death. <laughs> Potentially. That's what it says. Until he is dead. There's some talk of uh, trying to get the child tax credit done. I don't know what the prospects of that are. Some version of the permitting reform bill that was promised to Manchin as associated with the IRA. I don't know if that's going to happen. Look, these people barely work three days a week here, and we yeah. got two months. Yeah, they we, are... got, we got debt ceiling. We got same-sex marriage. We've got uh, Electoral Count Reform Act, and then all this other funding for Ukraine, for the government, for everything else. That sounds like a pretty full... That's like a pretty full agenda. Yeah, I mean, these are these people. These people run out of steam at four thirty. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so do I. So do I. Look, I respect. <laughs> them. They're early risers too. They got to <laughs> pee right. three times a night. Uh, They're last, old, is what I'm saying. Last but not least, Donald Trump is expected to announce his third presidential campaign from Mar-a-Lago at nine p.m. Eastern tonight, and a growing number of Republican politicians are not all that jazzed about it. Uh, now that the twice impeached, two time popular vote loser is responsible for the party's poor performance in the last three elections in a row. Uh, a new YouGov poll also shows that more Republicans now want Ron DeSantis to be the party's nominee over Trump by a slim 41 to 39 percent. I just saw another poll come through. It's from the Club for Growth that mm. did state by state in the early states. And it's got DeSantis beating Trump by 11 points in Iowa. 15 points in New Hampshire, 20 points in Georgia, 26 points in Florida. No surprise there. I guess not all early states. I'm not sure what their calendar is, but those Iowa and New Hampshire numbers, they, look, it could be juiced. I have no idea if a club for growth is a, a good pollster, but it's not going to make Mr. Trump very happy. No. A club for growth freaks. I love it. Just, I'm going to stop myself. <laughs> I, now I want to hear what you're going to do. Something about masturbating to the Dow and then making up the numbers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah, that's where I was. Workshop too. it a little bit, come back to the next pod. I didn't have it. Um, are you guys pretty psyched for another Trump campaign? <laughs> I get what it, it is funny. This is the last thing we talked about today in a very long list. Donald Trump is fucking running for president again. We're going to, it's happening, guys. Uh, it's just, Do you think he is as weak as he seems right now? I love it. You seem to think no, no from our earlier conversation. Absolutely. I, I just, I, look, maybe he is, maybe he is. I'm not going to make any predictions. All I would say is why our predictions are perfect. Uh, that. You know, there was a week after the insurrection where it seemed as though his political fortunes had turned. Uh, I would say uh, burning down the Capitol should be a bigger deal breaker than um, not getting as big of a majority in the House. Uh, but uh, we will see. But to voters, who knows? I, I, they want to win. If, if this was a conversation just about like, will the Republican politicians break from him finally or back him in the end? They'd be like, yeah, of course, they're going to rally around him in the end. That's what they always do. But the voters, <laughs> the, vote, the base is a different story. Laura Ingram on her show the other night was like, 
we can't be doing this anymore. I like, know. He's starting to lose. I know. To lose I, Fox. I just think like I really do think it's an open question. We forget how much institutional opposition he faced uh, before he started uh, 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 winning primaries in 2016. He never had a supportive majority of the party. He won because they were divided amongst the other people that decided to run. So. Uh, who knows? We'll see. Little Ron to Sanctimonious. Let's see I, if it works. The, I, I think the challenge for all these guys, I agree that I think that much like Democrats in 2020, Republican voters this time around will be care most about electability mm. and not losing again. Yeah. And so that would be the Achilles heel. I think the challenge for DeSantis and anybody else is that Trump politically is Mike Tyson and he punches everyone as hard as he can all the time and these guys come out and they shadow box him and they slap box him and they go for these sort of oblique criticisms in you know the Washington Times on background it's just like it's not going to work Trump has been able to consolidate the right wing the maga base the yeah. fox news primetime hosts time and time and time again and until we see like Tucker Carlson break or Sean Hannity break then i will start to wonder but it, yeah but not it, the like you know elitist london based owner of the new york post that like semaphore is all fired up about like I, that to me is not like where the base is so far um just about every republican candidate who has lost a race in this midterm has conceded um or at least has not claimed victory <laughs> um mm -hmm. uh and um i think that is wonderful for democracy first of all but second of all it hurts trump and it hurts it hurts trump's cause because one of the reasons he embraced the big lie in the first place is because he knew the worst thing that could happen to him was for him to be viewed as a loser and now republican voters are once again thinking mm, we've now lost again we've lost a bunch from 2012 to 2020 except for 2016 and not a great midterm in 2014 Democrats have won <laughs> every election. And so I think at some point, at some point, the voters might say, mm, mm. I wonder, because uh, if I'm if, just making the argument, I don't no, know. I, I don't know. None of us knows, obviously. But but I look at this, too, and they're like, I want to I'm a I'm a Republican. I want to win. And I got my two options here. I got Donald Trump, uh, who won in 2016. And I kind of think probably won in 2020. I mean, I've got Ron DeSantis, who I like a lot, but who I know, if he defeats Donald Trump in a primary, will be torn to absolute fucking smithereens by this guy and will come out like a wounded animal. Oh, oh, by Trump. Oh, oh. Like, I, I just, Trump, it is inconceivable to me, like, that Donald Trump goes quietly into the night. <laughs> you because know, the that's only, not going to happen. <laughs> because even if, like, whatever, like, if a Republican defeats a Democrat in 2024, Donald Trump will view that as a personal rebuke to him. It cannot be allowed to happen. Yeah, yeah, he'll burn the whole thing Go down. For it. Run as a third party candidate. Mm. <laughs> he will never do that because he's too lazy and he won't actually get on the ballot. He'll just be like a chaos yeah. agent yeah. on Truth Social. Yeah, which you know isn't isn't going Not that the worst far. Thing either. Um, all right. When we come back, Rebecca Katz and Kip Hebert from the Fetterman campaign join Tommy to talk about how they pulled off a big win against Dr. Oz. The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Simply Safe Home Security. Right now, Simply Safe's offering our listeners 50% off a new security system. Simply Safe makes it easy to protect what's important to you with advanced security technology and 24/7 professional monitoring. Simply Safe was named the best home security system of 2022 by US News and World Report. In an emergency, 24/7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get priority police response. Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. Their 24 7 professional monitoring service costs under a dollar a day, less than half the price of ADT's traditional professionally installed system. Losers. <laughs> I'm talking about a competition. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Stay in complete control of your system anytime, anywhere with the top rated Simply Safe app. Love it. What do you have to say about this product? That Why you do have you love it so much? Years? Well, I have a Simply Safe. Uh huh. I set it up. And you get basically you get this box. It has the base station, it has the keypad, and has some sensors. You can add your own more sensors than I ever much you need. You know, if you um, you know, if you're a Hadid or something, mm -hmm. and uh, they probably need more sensors. And uh, but for everybody else, good number in the box. And uh, then you set it up, and it just works perfectly. It's really easy to do. It takes like a few minutes. Everything's seamlessly. Everything's seamless. You follow the instructions, and you have the app on your phone. The app works great. You can turn it on or off remotely. It's a really good alarm system. Super easy to use and super reliable. Highly recommend. Don't miss your chance for massive savings on our favorite security system. Get 50% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash crooked today. 
This is their biggest discount of the year. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Pot Save America is brought to you by Lomi. Talk about how much garbage you take out food waste. A lot. A lot. A lot of garbage in my house. Got to take it out. We've been taking out a lot of trash this week, guys. That's the right. The elections and food waste. You bet. Nice. You've been, we've been putting it all in our Lomis. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Oz, you're going in there. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorically. Lomi allows you to turn your food scraps into dirt with the push of a button. Lomi's a countertop electric composter that turns scraps to dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs, and it's really quiet. Here's the deal. You get your Lomi, you get your trash, you put it in the Lomi, you get some dirt. It's great. Why would you want that? You put the dirt in your backyard, you're growing plants, maybe you're growing some more food, you're eating that food, and then you put it back in the Lomi to grow more food. It's just a, a sustainable system. It's a cycle. It's the a cycle. It's the, it's the circle of life. It's the circle of lonely. lonely. It's the circle of lonely. Lonely. Anyway, Anywho. if you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash crooked and use the promo code crooked to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash crooked and use promo code crooked at checkout. Food waste is gross. Lomi is your solution. With the holidays just around the corner, Lomi will make the perfect gift for someone on your shopping list. Pod Save America is brought to you by Sleep Me. Science tells us that the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering core body temperature. Temperature controlled sleep repairs muscle after a hard day's work and improves cognitive function, so you always start your day feeling sharp and alert. Sleep Me is the new home for chilly sleep, which is the name we don't say anymore. Nope. We're never. bringing you the same great sleep that that other brand offered but under a new name new name new name it's called sleep me they make the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available they create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures promoting deeper restorative sleep sleep me makes the uler cube and dock pro sleep systems water-based temperature controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide your ideal sleep temperature they also just launched the new Doc Pro Sleep System. It has two times more cold power than other models. It's whisper quiet and has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. Pair it with the new Sleep.me app for enhanced device control and sleep scheduling. Look, I always sleep hot. No matter how cool it is outside, I always sleep hot. And now I have the Uler. And let me tell you, I tell wake us. up, I have a deep sleep, and I wake up very comfortable. Yeah. It really does help. It's amazing. Cooler than a family dinner at uh, Mar-a-Lago. Nice. Mm. What? Yep. I see. 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 Tiffany's wedding's in some trouble. Well, that's tough. That's, <laughs> that's more of a natural disaster. That's tough. That's tough. Head over to sleepme.com slash cricket to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for Pod Save America listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep, S L E E P dot M E slash crooked to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up refreshed every day. Pod Save America is brought to you by Movement Watches. Whoa. Wow. Hey, 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 where you been, Movement? I love these guys. <laughs> they rethought the watch game. They sure did. They're Tommy. back. They sure did. It's always good to walk your own path and beat your own drum. That's what we've always yeah. said. Yeah, that's love it. a big fan of that. <laughs> no, I'm always beating my own drum. <laughs> That's something movement understands. Since day one, movement has oh, been... Oh, now I get it. Move, <laughs> so, <laughs> ah, shit. Movement has been doing things different by creating watches with refreshingly clean designs, top-tier materials, and unbeatable prices. He's talking about... He's talking about... <laughs> now you can stand out with movement swatches, eyewear, and more during their Black Friday seasonal sale with a discount you can't miss. So give your wrist a workout with a great watch from movement. <laughs> <laughs> movements designs coming. This is why people happy listen to back this. movement, huh? Is what you wanted? Is what you get? <laughs> <laughs> movements designs come in countless styles. Is this the Barstool Sports ad right now? Yeah, every occasion, guys, yeah, yeah. Shop, people will remember this. Shop with confidence by enjoying a 24-month warranty, free shipping, and free returns on orders over fifty dollars. Watches were just the beginning. Movement's line of eyewear and jewelry is designed to set you apart for all the right reasons. Love the sunglasses. And check out Movement Ever Scroll Eyewear. It helps filter out the most intense blue light rays so you can look your best while doing your best work. Yeah. I need to Helpful get some to, of those. Maybe that's what the Republicans were using, and that's why they thought they saw a red wave. Ooh. You know what I mean? I like oh, that. Hey. Wow. Wow. Hey. 
filtered out the blue. That's some resistance cringe right there. I bet it is. <laughs> be the good be the good gifter with movement during their Black Friday seasonal sale. Get a special discount of twenty five percent off site wide with code BF twenty five just in time for the holidays. Join the movement today at mvmt.com. That's mvmt.com. Uh, I am thrilled to be joined now by two of the brilliant minds that help propel John Fetterman to victory. Rebecca Katz and Kip Hebert, thank you both for being here. Thanks. Good to be Thanks here. Thanks for having us. Uh, so why don't we just start with the basics? Why don't we, can you guys just like quickly tell folks what you did for the campaign? Why don't you start, Rebecca? Uh, sure. So uh, we've been with John now for about seven years. So um, we basically had been working with him on communications and just like general strategy that whole time. That's excellent. Um, I should note for just for history that Rebecca and I worked together on the John Edwards for president. A very long time ago. In 2004 campaign, uh, which that was I called the good one, the good Edwards campaign, because, you know, we tried our that, that as well. <laughs> we'll let that go there. OK, so we're going to get to the big picture stuff in a minute about how you guys won and all the strategy. But first question, it just has to be about Snooki, because in case listeners don't know what I'm talking about, the Fetterman campaign released the funniest campaign of the cycle by, sorry, the funniest video I've seen from a campaign maybe ever. It starred uh, the Jersey Shore star Snooki. Do we call them stars? I guess we do. Talking about Dr. Oz leaving his home in New Jersey to go find a new job in Pennsylvania. Like genuinely hilarious. Um, I read that you guys first tried to get a video from The Situation, another Jersey Shore cast member, but that he didn't deliver. What what happened there? What happened with uh, with Mike? I mean, where, where to begin? Uh, so first of all, you have to know that New Jersey wasn't just about like shit posting. It was actually the number one thing that was popping off on odds with regular voters that, you know, people from Pennsylvania, especially Philly, don't like New Jersey. Um, and um, so we were we were having some fun with this New Jersey theme. John was doing the memes. And so we had a, a bunch of ideas about, you know, people from New Jersey and then tactics. So it was just, you know, I remember calling up Kip and we were talking about Jersey Shore and Cameo. And then and then we tried the situation. And then Kip, why don't you talk about what happened? We got it back. Yeah, I mean, to his credit, he turned it around in a couple of days. Um, it took <laughs> I don't think he has much else to do, though. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I believe it's like in mid-June, we we first had this idea. I wrote up like a, a script, um, sort of sent that to the situation. He sent us back something a couple of days later that was... I guess you could say off message. Uh -huh. um, still, but like our, you know, our, our white whale was 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 Snooky. We always that's one we always wanted, um, and we submitted it. And she, there's this thing on Cameo where if you don't, if the celebrity doesn't do it within seventy seven days, they refund your money, and then you have to submit it again. Mm -hmm. And we submitted it four times. Oh my god! Um, and then finally, in I think we had given up a hope that it would actually ever really happen. And then in mid July, we were in the middle of like a staff meeting, and I got an email from Cameo that said it. She had done it and we just stopped everything and watched it several times. We were screaming. I mean, it was it was the most perfect piece of, of video presentation I've ever seen in my life. It was just she she nailed it. it was um, and then and then it exploded. It really felt like there was like a time on the campaign before Snooky and then after Snooky. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, did you enjoy it more than Crudite? How did that yes. rank? Yes. Okay. I mean, the, the Crudite was him, the Snooky was us. You know right, what I mean? Right. Like we had well, I think you guys actually discovered a lot of the, the Crudite video. That was, you know, um, missed by some folks because he recorded it like back in April or something. But Snooki was just something that we had been having so much fun with New Jersey. Like, do you remember that he recorded a message for Pennsylvania voters from his mansion in New Jersey? I know like, that, that because you guys told everybody and you landed that, that. Was, yeah Nick Gavio <laughs> on our team found that out and was, you know he was he was looking at the video he's like and he sent in the group chat um I I think this is new I think this is New Jersey house and we, and we all stopped everything that we were doing we um we spent the whole day trying to figure out if it really was the same house and I think Kip you were the one that found the the book case right like yeah there's there's no way to talk about this without sounding completely crazy but I, I found it eight books in a row that were the same color and size in both of the two photos. And I was like, okay, this is definitely it. But we were analyzing it like was the, the Sapruder film or something. Oh, so God, I love it. But I mean, like, so the Snooki video gets at a broader point about the campaign that John ran, which is that the tone of the messaging, you guys seemed like you were having fun. We're having fun talking about it right now. 
the attacks on Dr. Oz, they were tough, but they didn't read it, read as harsh or mean, especially, especially when compared to what the monsters who worked for Dr. Oz eventually ended up saying about John's health. How did you like settle on that approach in that tone? Is it a strategy that's uniquely suited to running against someone who is a, let's face it, a clown, or is it like something Well, broader? he wasn't always the clown. I mean, that's, I mean, we, I feel like we made him a clown. I mean, when he was running in the primary, they didn't view him as a clown. They mm -hmm. were running xenophobic and hateful negative acts, right? Like we, John is from Pennsylvania. Like he, he gets it, right? So he knew we had real research to back up that people did not like, you know, the fact that Oz just moved here to try and win the Senate race. And and John wanted to have fun with it. Remember, these are the early days that he was recovering from his stroke. Mm -hmm. We were we were having internal meetings, but he wasn't out on the trail yet. And he just, I remember he just started sending us memes and they were really funny, you know? And so he really started, it wasn't that like when they go low, we go, you know, we go high. Like we sure. didn't go high. We just tried to have some fun, yeah. you know, and like, and it worked and it, it, it comes from the candidate, yeah. really. Usually the campaign that's having more fun is the campaign that's winning, right? And I and uh, yes, John is a unique person and Oz is also very unique, but I do think that there is something that here that more Democrats should take advantage of because using humor allows you to, to deliver a negative message that just doesn't feel negative, right? Mm -hmm. And it especially when you're doing it in a bunch of different ways, like, you know, we found that I mean, uh exit polls show that like 56% of Pennsylvania voters said that Dr. Oz didn't know Pennsylvania well enough. And this wasn't something that had been a message focus of our since the summer. So like, I think it really did stick in or wow. sink in. Um, and, you know, in a tack ad, you can respond with like, okay, well, here are the facts. But like a good joke, like mockery is hard to respond to. I mean, the only way is, is by being funnier. And if I might overgeneralize, Republicans are not funny. Yeah. Like, I think that this is a thing <laughs> that Democrats need to do more because professional Republicans, at least, They've um, like, as you alluded to with the, uh, you know, making fun of John stroke, they view cruelty and humor as the same thing. Um, and they just instinctively punch down, which is something that just, you know, as human beings is not funny. Yeah. Um, so I think this is an area where Democrats have an advantage and should use more. I, I could not agree more. I mean, so like, again, just stepping back a little, like I can't imagine anything more challenging on a campaign than losing your greatest asset, which is your candidate's ability to campaign for several months during the, during the race. Um, that's obviously what happened when when John had the stroke. How, how did you guys even begin to think about how to, how to deal with that, uh, knowing you know that you're not going to be able to move election day? I mean, it was hard. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend it was easy. I mean, it was it, there was like shell shock coming. Like really, we drove right from the hospital to the election night party on primary day. Like it was, and then we won every county in Pennsylvania, like it was happening quickly. And then there was, um, and then we went right into focus groups. Honestly, we had, we were running on two tracks and I mean, the research showed exactly what John had been saying all along that, you know, like that people actually care about real human issues, you know, and he was just, he was real. And so we decided to share the recovery a little bit. And mm -hmm. it, it wasn't easy for him. You know, when you have something like a stroke, you want to go away for a few months and, and recover in private. And there was such a, a drumbeat of like, when is he coming out there? And it was just, it was, it wasn't, that part wasn't fun, yeah. but we decided to, to go out before he was perfect and to show people a little bit about like that humanity. And I think a lot of reporters just thought, like looked at him and just said, like, he's not, he can't do this. And a lot of folks actually like, this resonated with them. It, it was like a family member. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like the the biggest obvious instance of this was the debate. I mean, when we had John on Pod Save America, I didn't do that interview. But when I listened back, you know, there were times where, where I winced a little bit. You know, I, I watched the debate online. I found it hard to watch in moments in part because like I fell for him as a human being, but also because, look, I'm a hack. I worried about how it would play politically. Now I have like made a fool of myself enough with predictions to know not to do that anymore. Right. So I shut the fuck up. Um, but a lot of reporters and pundits predicted doom and gloom. What do you think they got wrong? Is it that voters I think are more? They got a lot wrong. I mean, I think when I when I, this debate, people came out of it believing that John had had a stroke, and that Oz was like a, a snake oil salesman who was going to take away their abortion right, the right to an abortion, right? And people already knew 
that John had a stroke. Yeah. So the, it wasn't like they were learning something new, but they also knew he was getting better. And and he was he was brave. He was reading through captions. He was doing something that no one had really done before, and the stakes were very high. Oz, he as Kip likes to say, he was like lying on he television for 20 years. It 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 was. It, it was a place where he felt comfortable and he didn't do that good a job. And then he was a little too honest in terms of talking about local political leaders uh, taking away abortion rights. Yeah. And people people looked I mean, that was the takeaway. The, I mean, we turned the the women on on the, the team. The second that Oz said that about local political leaders, all of us kind of yelled at the same time. And um, we turned that into an ad. And we, we, you know, when pe- people in Pennsylvania think of local political leaders, they think of people like Doug Mastriano. They don't want him, you know, in charge of their rights. Um, and so it was a real blunder. And most reporters missed it. I mean, Kip, I saw Rebecca say, you know, the coverage the next day was basically like candidates spar, candidates trade barbs, yeah. right? Like typical stuff. What like w- were the D.C. pundits not reading the local coverage or is that a ready fire aim approach? Like, how do you think it got so, I don't know, twisted on on social media mostly? I think there's a tendency for reporters and political insiders because we are the ones who care about sound bites. Like, like nobody's harder on our, you know, our candidates than, than ourselves um, to think that this is how voters think. But pretty much everything um, that we know suggests that that's, you know, just another sort of DC obsession. Like, I think it also, John was also able to survive it in part because he had never been a can- candidate who tried to come up as, as the slickest or most polished. Like John was real. Like that first and foremost, that was his biggest asset. And that really continued through the stroke through, you know, showing him flaws and all, um, you know, people sometimes say that John uh, is an effective politician because he's like a regular person. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's a regular person. Like, if you just look at him, it doesn't look like that, but he's a real person. Right. You know, um, you're getting the real, the real thing. It's, you know, unfiltered. It's not scripted. It's not polished. And I think because John has always been that way, because we ran the whole campaign that way, you know, we were able to to show people what the, what was really happening here. And I think, um, to their credit, I think the voters of Pennsylvania were a lot more sympathetic to John than some of the reporters covering him. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And I, frankly, I, I also thought that Oz came off as like really like slick and fast talking and aggressive and it, it didn't play that well to me. Um, there was it's this- mean, but his yeah. whole campaign was mean. I mean, yeah. that's the whole thing. Like you can't pretend to be Mr. Nice Guy when you say the things that your that campaign has said. And I think it caught up with him. Saying that if John had eaten a vegetable, he maybe wouldn't have had a stroke is one of the most insanely tone deaf, like disgraceful things I've ever seen a flack say. I'm surprised that person wasn't fired. But that's the whole point. He didn't fire her. Mm-hmm. Right. Like she still had the job. And and if if anyone on our staff had said something like that, like there would be zero tolerance for yeah. that kind. of. Yeah. And and then what Oz did, which was so Oz like, is then he just said, well, she doesn't speak for me. She only speaks for the kid. <laughs> Oh my God. So, I mean, it was just, he just, he, he couldn't, no matter, even as a stroke survivor, John was much stronger than Oz ever was. And, and voters saw that. Yeah. There was this huge debate at the end of the campaign in all the races about whether Democrats should be talking about abortion access, democracy, inflation, the economy, like some Twitter geniuses wanted to focus on Paul Pelosi for a cycle. What did you guys hear at the end from voters and what worked when it came to persuading uh, and turning them out? I mean, so the the voters who were still like the ones that we were persuading were the, those independent suburban women. And then for turnout, we were still making sure that all of all of our, you know, like everyone in Philadelphia got out to vote and things like that. And I think, first of all, we had Oprah, which was the most beautiful gift I think we could have ever asked for. And she said this very devastating quote about Oz, where she said, you know, she said, if if um if she lived in Pennsylvania, she would have already voted for John Fetterman. And she said, for quote unquote, many reasons. <laughs> and I thought that was the most devastating thing I've ever heard because it's just like, you don't know what they are, but you know, it's bad. And um, she just kind of dropped that news on, uh, on a, a Thursday at night. And then we had the view the next day where we were talking uh, to those same women. And then we had Obama come in on that Saturday and it just felt, we just felt like we had momentum. Mm-hmm. Like it just felt really, really great on the ground. Yeah. I mean, Kip, you, you guys did those events with Obama at the end of the campaign. They looked big. They felt exciting, right? I was sitting here in LA on Twitter, like all inspired all over again because I'm a, you know, has been. <laughs> but did those rallies translate into votes in a way you guys felt you could quantify? I mean, it certainly, it translated into great coverage. 
wall to wall. And also, you know, Donald Trump gave us a, basically an incline uh, contribution by coming to Pennsylvania on the same day. So really, like it couldn't have been a better way to close out the campaign by showing the contrast between you know, somebody who's like he was trying to present himself as moderate, but was standing with Trump, literally standing with Trump and Mastriano, whereas John, you know, he might be, have an unconventional style, but he's, you know, you know, a relatively mainstream Democrat. Obviously, you know, he's I'd say he's a good Democrat, but he's not, you know, they were trying to portray him as extreme and scary. Mm -hmm. And like there is nothing extreme. It's like Biden's ratings might not have been great, but there's nothing extreme or scary about Joe Biden. No, no, there is not. Uh, I mean, the flip side is you guys got a barrage of attacks. A lot of them were on crime from Dr. Oz, from super PACs, were there ones that really stuck or worried you? And if so, how did you rebut those? I mean, it was a hundred million dollars in attack ads. Like, let's just talk about like from the middle of August to the end of September, we were out there basically by ourselves. Like the, the, in the, the, we didn't get real backup until October mm -hmm. with the outside group. So, so for six weeks, they were just beating the shit out, shit about out of us all day long. And then Fox News all night long mm -hmm. was just going after John, Sean Hannity, Tugger Carlson, yeah. the worst. So it was just, it was like nonstop attacks. And they were going after his character because they didn't, they knew that Oz's ratings were so low that they couldn't, they couldn't bring him up. So they wanted to tear John down. So they spent just like going after everything. Fox News went after um, John's wife, Giselle, and just like pretended that, you know, John was a vegetable and Giselle was behind the scenes, just like crazy batshit stuff. And they, they just didn't stop. And they were, they were relentless. And our side wasn't like, we weren't as, we weren't me, you know, we were talking about what was on the table. And I think voters at the, at the end of the day decided they wanted more normal, you know, representation than these, these crazy people out there. And it was, it was very mean spirited too. Yeah. The it was nasty. A hundred million dollars. That's so much money. But, but that goes back to our July stuff. Like when, like when John was doing all the snooky, you know, you can yeah. make fun of it. People thought he was funny and they liked him. Yeah. Right. And if you have a candidate for a state like Pennsylvania, where the, the Republicans are going to come after with everything they have, which is a, like a hundred million dollars, you got to be fucking likable at the end of the day, because mm -hmm. like they're, they're, they're just going to bring those negative, you know, approvals down as much as possible. So you have to at the end of the day, like you have to get people to, to like, you know, to, to say that they're going to vote for you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is a long question. So bear with me, but you know, the strategy you guys ran was very smart in my opinion, like John outran Biden in these sort of rural, more red counties, pushed down Oz's numbers there. And then you run up the score in Philly and other sort of urban places to, to win that sometimes gets shorthanded, including by you guys, I think is like a strategy where Democrats have to go everywhere, right? You go to every County, you count on every vote. That's the key to victory. The pushback mm -hmm. I hear when I sort of evangelize that kind of strategy from Democrats is they point to Beto O'Rourke's race in Texas and they say that guy went everywhere literally for four years. I like, couldn't have worked harder, still fell short. I was talking to a statewide elected official the other day who said to me, like, if I hear you guys talk about this go everywhere shit one more time on your podcast, my head is going to explode because I go everywhere. I go to red counties and it gets me nothing. So I guess the question is, is it better to describe the strategy as Democrats need to pick candidates like John, who for whatever reason, background policy look, can get a hearing everywhere versus go everywhere? I mean, so there's a couple of different arguments here, right? Yeah. Like, yes, I think I think you want, we need better candidates. I think there's been this like um, milk toast kind of cookie cutter Democratic ideal candidate that loses a lot of general elections that we've seen run statewide a lot. I also think a lot of this is about having candidates who know who they are and who have backbone. I mean, John went into those those counties, those deep red counties, and he talked about what abortion rights, gay rights. He like there was no, there was nothing he said there that he wouldn't say in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. And he went into those counties and he said, "I want to be the fifty first vote for Democrats in the Senate." He wasn't afraid to be a Democrat. I mean, you remember when, when Obama was president, we had people running for Senate who were afraid to say they voted for him. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. we can't have that kind of like if we as a party need to actually be a little bit more um, confident and not ashamed of who we are. And I think that's part of it, too. So it's about going to every county, but then having something to say when you go there. Kip, you got a thoughts from my go everywhere critics who yell at me? Well, I mean, I think another thing, another lesson for uh, from John's race that I think applies could apply to a lot of Democrats is, you know, as Rebecca said, stop apologizing for being a Democrat. Just be confident in who you are and what you stand for. And I think people will respect that. Um, but I think it's also illustrative that, you know, John 
one in a year when the president was unpopular and he did it he didn't do it by trashing his own party he didn't do it by throwing biden under the bus he didn't do it by running hard to the right he did it by being himself not apologizing for it and just you know having confidence in his convictions that you know whatever they're going to say we are still the party that's you know closer to like what the mainstream of pennsylvania actually wants and not just um, confidence in his convictions but courage in his convictions you know i think that was that's part of it too. Like they came after us on crime. They came after us about his stroke, whatever it was, we just talked about it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and John had a record to point to, and he wasn't just going to sit like, I think there's been too many Democrats who try to be Republicans on, on, on some of these issues just because they're afraid to be attacked. And I mean, John was head of a board of pardons, you know, he let, like he allowed innocent men to leave prison because it was the right thing to do mm -hmm. right but he knew when he did that that people were going to come after him and use it in attack ads and they did and it was like and he did it so people wouldn't die in prison for for crimes they were wrongly convicted of doing yeah. you know like it's like he had humanity and i think it comes back to that a lot yeah yeah no i'll be honest when i saw his response uh uh to those attacks and the idea that he should have just sort of let a couple guys rot in prison for the rest of their lives were wrongly convicted just because it would have been bad politics. That's when I was like, all right, this, this guy's for me. Um, okay. Looking ahead, uh, you know, I, I've luckily in this job, I've gotten to work with like, talk to a lot of smart people like you. Um, I talked to Ben Wickler, the head of the Wisconsin democratic party all the time. I like, thank God that for what he and his team are doing every day, there's just like two years, four years, like party building infrastructure. What do you think Democrats need to do to be prepared in the same way in, in Pennsylvania in 2024? And is there the same sort of state party infrastructure that we should be investing in and building off of? Right. I mean, as you know, I come from the Harry Reid machine, yeah. right? And like, this is this is all about like investing in the party infrastructure and like building something for years and years and years. I think we should be doing that everywhere. I also think we need better, more competent staff, like in a way that like the, there's a lot with campaign staffers that you kind of just go... And you do it for a little bit and then you like leave. I think we we actually need to get some professional staffing staffers who can get better and, and wiser and help um, usher in like a new generation of talent. We, we need a bench. We don't have that right now. I think we're starting to get some some rising stars. We need more of them. Um, but I think I don't I don't think these these scary right wingers are going anywhere. And I think we need to be able to fight back hard. And not just, you know, say like, you know, there, there's some good people on that side. Like, you know, like, I think we have to understand what some of these risks are and, and what's out there and fight back. Yeah. Uh, Kip, you mentioned before that that Snooki was kind of your white whale. W were there any white whales that didn't get back to you or like hits you wish you could have delivered that you never that got left on the cutting room? I mean, we really would have loved to have done something with It's Always Sunny, um, just given the connection there just sort of seemed like a match made in heaven. But that you know, proved to be difficult for contractual issues. I mean, for a long time, a we had been hearing about there's this puppy story that's coming and we just kept hearing about it in the background oh. for months and months and months. <clears throat> and it just sounded like the worst, you know, the worst thing ever. And then it, it, it came out and it kind of was. Uh, um, it was worse than we had heard it would be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was dis it, it, disgraceful. I mean, like inhuman. I mean, th that's such a good example of how politics and like campaigning has changed because when I was like doing oppo hits against Sarah Palin, right? Like you beg the Wall Street Journal to write that story up for six months based on some oppo. And like, if, if they run it, you're psyched. If not, it can just die. Like the fact that where, where did that end up? It was um a uh, Gawker. Jezebel. Yeah, it was Jezebel, right? Like it didn't matter that it was on, you know, a blog that some people might not have heard from about before. Like it exploded either way. Um, well, because it, it was true. Right. I mean, it exploded because like he couldn't he couldn't deny it. Like he was like he did the most horrible, horrible things. And the contrast to that with John and Giselle having these like rescue pups, like I mean, they have a, a, a three legged dog who had been abused. I mean, they they really they are they are rescue dog people. So like Oz could not have been more like the um the the cartoon villain, I would say, except he was actually like killing puppies i mean it was like you couldn't make it up yeah that's just the worst uh final thoughts just any, any like final thoughts from from both of you on lessons to learn from this cycle and and things we should just be thinking about going forward because obviously 
you know, the results were better than a lot of us anticipated. Maybe they're better than we anticipated because Democrats sometimes, myself very much included, assume the worst is going to happen based on recent history. But Rebecca, why don't you go first? I mean, abortion, like let's, let's talk about that for just one more sec. Like we would not be where we are today, the, all the Democrats, in, unless women's rights were taken away very drastically and horribly, right? And we can't just sit around and high five. Like we have to fight back. We have to codify Roe. We have to codify same sex of marriage. Like we have, we have a lot of work to do. And as we go into the next Congress, um, we got to try and push through as much as possible because I, I think there's some really bad things coming. And I think the lesson here is like when you get power, like, let's produce some results. Use it, yeah. Kip, thoughts? I mean, one thing I would love uh, the party to take away from this is reevaluating the idea, um, its idea of who we consider to be electable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think often there's just this assumption that bland and generic candidates are going to be our best chance of winning. And I just don't know that it's really played out that way. I think, in fact, you know, a lot of these white bread candidates, they they try to appeal to absolutely everyone. And as a result, they excite pretty much no one. Um, and I think one of the reasons John was able to succeed this year is in large part because he's not straight from central casting. It allowed him to establish his own sort of independent image. It means he, you know, he doesn't necessarily like rise and fall along with Biden. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we could be missing it. We've, we've missed out on a lot of candidates like John before yeah. um, by. Guys, we missed out on him in 2016 when he ran. That's right. That's right. I'll, I'll try or to think. The party went with somebody else. I mean, this isn't John, but I was trying to think when was the last time you think the Democrats ran a candidate for a statewide office who had not graduated from college, for example? Like that's there's there's clearly like a massive gap in terms of Republicans and Democrats in terms of uh, college educated voters. And I wonder if we tried speaking to those voters from a place of experience, for example, you know, shamelessly embracing economic populism. We know it works, but. Too many Democrats aren't, aren't, aren't into that. Yeah. So And super, super tall U.S. senators. I think that's the other thing. Really, <laughs> really tall. Uh, well, listen, Kip, Rebecca, thank you guys for everything you did to make this happen. Uh, literally can't thank you enough for, like, you know, saving democracy. And, and a special thank you to all the Pod Save boys. I mean, we, we were up against Fox News and we had, like, you. So <laughs> thank you because it's just – it is – there is there is not an apparatus to really effectively deal with with the right wing media that's coming at us. And so we thank you for what you do as well. Listen, uh, you're very nice to say that we are trying to build a progressive media infrastructure. If you wouldn't mind letting some of the folks over at the White House know that it would be a good thing to help cultivate and build and, uh, <laughs> and care and feed places like us, that would be helpful. But listen, we're going to do it anyway. So I appreciate it. Not sure if they listen to me, but it sounds good. <laughs> they should. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Talk to you. Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Article has everything you need to turn your bedroom into your best room, all for a great price. Love Article. Used it a lot. We have Article furniture in the office. Also, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, they just got their house renovated, and they were so happy to get an Article bed. They said it looks great. They were very happy with the experience. Article is the easiest way to make your space look beautiful. They combine the curation of a boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. Their team of designers focuses on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, and durable construction. They are dedicated to a modern aesthetic of mid-century Scandinavian industrial and bohemian designs. Fast, affordable shipping is available across the USA and Canada and is free on orders over $999. All in-stock items are delivered in two weeks or less. Article cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you. No showrooms, no salespeople, no retail markups. You save up to 30% over traditional retail prices. Article's offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash crooked and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's A-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com slash crooked for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Pod Save America is brought to you by Blue Land. The holidays can create even more waste than usual. Each year, Americas throw away 25% more trash from Thanksgiving to New Year's. What if we told you there was a way to get all your holiday shopping done without the guilty feeling over the waste that typically comes with it? Meet Blue Land. Blue Land's on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by inventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet. In this holiday season, Blue Land's having its best sale of the year, so you can save and shop sustainably for your friends, family, even yourself. The idea is simple. Grab one of the beautiful Forever bottles, fill it with warm water, drop in the tablet, and get cleaning. Refills start at $2.25, and you don't have to buy a new plastic bottle every time you run out. 
You can even set up a subscription or buy in bulk so you never run out of the products you use the most. Try their Clean Essentials kit, which has everything you need to get started in signature scents, such as iris agave, fresh lemon, and eucalyptus mint. Plus, for a limited time, Blue Land's hand soap is getting a festive upgrade with a beautiful chocolate box inspired gift set Ooh, wow that's nice yeah that got your attention didn't it love it with that... cozy scents like evergreen winterberry and peppermint hell yeah love blue land it really is a great idea i just went to their website because i need we need some hand soap in our house so getting that done right now yeah we have blue land products and um they look great you don't have to keep ordering more plastic and uh the products are just fantastic to take advantage of their best sale of the year, go to blueland.com slash crooked. You don't want to miss this. Blueland.com slash crooked. That's blueland.com slash crooked. Pods of America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. We all have people in our lives who we're thankful to for helping us navigate life. Sure do. Your spouse, nanny, therapist, assistant, housekeeper. All of the above. Producers. Oh. <laughs> Producers. We can also be grateful for those who make our work lives easier. That's why it's so important to have the right people on your team. And if you want to hire those people for your business... You need ZipRecruiter. You, you need ZipRecruiter. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. What's to appreciate about ZipRecruiter? What's not to appreciate That's about really the question. is really the question. It uses powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. Additionally, you'll love ZipRecruiter's complete suite of tools. Got a suite of tools right here. Hey. It's right like, here in the uh, My favorite suite of tools. It's like a Kushner and his buddies. <laughs> Because they make it so easy to filter, review, and rate your candidates. Plus, four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So, if you want a stress-free hiring process, trust me, you'll be so thankful you tried ZipRecruiter. Just go to our special URL to try it for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. All right, before we go, Hallie Kiefer is back. She's back. By popular demand. Why are you waving at us? It's a podcast. I know. We're in the same room. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We're going to play a game about Donald Trump in honor of his announcement today. (laughs) It's exciting. Hallie, Um, take it away. I will. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, Over the weekend, Senate running back Josh Hawley tweeted, (laughs) um, the old party is dead. Time to bury it. Build something new. While Hawley might want to inter Trump's legacy, his fellow Republicans are running in circles trying to decide the party line on the farm for a president, given that O'Dowdy Boy is uh, going to be announcing his 2024 run on Tuesday night. Are they all going to run like rats off the ship? Or are they, are they excited to scrape Trump's ketchup off the White House walls for four more years? <laughs> While plenty of Republicans seem confused about whose boots to start licking, Trump's or Ron DeSantis' gorgeous white knee-high numbers, others have made a definitive statement, and that's all I needed to bring you a game. Here's how this is going to work. I'm going to read you the name of a Republican. You're going to tell me what you think they've indicated post-elect, post-midterms with regards to Trump. Are they riding the Trump train? Mm exiting the Trump train via the emergency exit, or are they sort of just dangling precariously, holding out with one hand to the Trump train as like a Bond villain's henchman as the Republican <laughs> Party hurtles around a sheer cliff? <laughs> so those are the options, riding, exiting, or dangling. Got it. I'm mm-hmm. just going to read the name, and you let me know where do you think we've landed, and I'm going to read you the quote that, again... Can any of them be trusted? No. And also, I don't. You might have all heard this. It's been the post-election cycle has been like insane in the news. But are you ready to play? Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. All so right. <clears throat> Senator Bill Cassidy, a Republican of Louisiana, and oh. love it. I guarantee <laughs> you probably don't know the answer to this. Mm-hmm. What did he say with regards to Trump on Meet the Press? And is he riding? Is he exiting? Or is he is he dangling? I know what he said. Okay. I know what he said. Well, he where said, do you think he said it? He said, uh, uh, yeah, "It's not a. We're not a cult," mm-hmm. is what he said. Mm. But honestly, it seemed like a way out of answering to me. He's dangling. Okay. That's how mm. I feel about it. It f- felt like it was. It was between dangle and, and exit. exit. I know. But I think I'll. I go with dangle. Yeah, Louisiana. I. Uh, I think you're. You're dangling for dear life. I think he can't jump off that train yet. I think he'd like to leave the train, mm. mm-hmm. but he doesn't feel. I mean, safe most to. of these people are. Yeah, nobody wants heart, to be on the train. They're, they're leaving in their hearts. Yeah. yeah. How do we adjudicate this? Do we call them? <laughs> I. I think there's unfortunately no way to know. It's, okay. it's a game with no meaning. Uh, it <laughs> I exists love it. in a limited time. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> well. Also, even if there were definitive answers, they just change their minds. That's Perfect. the problem. Republican That's Party. Right. I think. I think his majority rules dangling. Great. Right. Dangling. And, uh, just it's to a read dangle. the full quote. We're not a we're not a cult. We're not like okay. There's one person who leads our party. Could have fooled me, Bill Cassidy. 
Um, how do we feel about Senator-elect? I'm sorry to even say that. J.D. Vance out of Ohio. <laughs> How you think of, yeah. Oh, oh he is he's on, he is on that train. He's got to yeah, be on the train. That train no got him where he needed yeah. to go. Peter Thiel paid for that with good money. Yeah, that's how he got his ticket. Now, this I can say definitively yes, because he said every year the media uh, writes Donald Trump's political obituary, and every year we're quickly reminded that Trump remains the most popular figure in the Republican Party. That, of course, was saying he's excited um, to for Trump to be the 2024 nominee. J.D. Vance, absolutely riding. Fact check true, that whole statement. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous. Um, Senator John Thune, Republican from South mm. Dakota, and I guarantee you <laughs> might not that. know. Doesn't make sense to do, a, do the voice. <laughs> well, it's just, a, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I feel as though he's going to exit the Trump train sooner or later. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Well, that blew my hair back. <laughs> Obviously, you can't see it again. We are videotaping this. My eyebrows are just singed by that. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow <laughs> i mean i think he wants to exit he's probably wanted to exit for a while i bet yeah. he's i bet he said something that's a dangle yeah i think he's a yeah. dangler he's he's not trying to, he doesn't want to make not because he doesn't want off but because he didn't want to make news yeah i think he's and he wants to be minority leader majority leader i want to say he actually went public he basically blamed trump's endorsements for the midterms Ooh. losses and he said you can't have a party that's built around one person's personality again they really did try though wow yeah. sooner or later he's, he's out of here you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, it's just the same, it's joke. same joke. I know. No, but it's funny when he said it. It, was funny, it, it felt better when he said it. Uh, so that, yeah. I think the that's listeners agreed. That's more of an exit than Cassidy. Yeah, yeah I agree. for sure. I agree. For a sure, little yeah. bit more. And then, um, how about uh, Representative Elise uh, Stefanik from oh, uh, New York? Ugh. Where do you think we're headed? She's she so, so on. Yeah. She's the she's the conductor. Yeah, she's in. She's in. Yeah, she's in. Yeah, yeah, she got one of those hats with the lines on it. Yeah. yeah um, well, I I don't even know if he asked her to or wanted her to, but she already preemptively endorsed Trump. So threw her weight behind him. Wow. I'm proud, Harvard's finest. I'm proud to school. endorse Donald Trump for president 2024. It's time for Republicans to unite around the most popular Republican in America, who has a proven track record of conservative governance. I'm just. I just want to say one more time about this place called Harvard. They they take all these kids, half of them turn evil, and then the <laughs> evil ones battle the good ones for 500 years. <laughs> so stupid. Shut it down. Take away their endowment. Tax it. Do wow, something. Wow, wow. This place has to be stopped. Harvard grads, let us know what you think. <laughs> and they waitlisted me twice. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, the only, oh, I was going to tell a terrible story about going to Harvard, but uh, millions of people listen to this. It's not, it's not really worth it. <laughs> Doesn't stop love it. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, you got to forget that. Um, I went to Harvard once and I got crabs, and that's, that's all I'm saying. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. Yeah. Nice. Um, Tom Cotton. Tom Cotton. Where do we think he's? Ugh. Is he Oof. riding? Is he jumping out the back of the train, or is he holding uh, on for dear life? I, he's got a dangle. He's got a dangle. I'm going to, I'm going to, I have no idea, but I'm going to say riding because he did float hilariously that he was considering a run, but he decided against it. Not that the people decided they hated him <laughs> and they didn't want him to run. So I'm going to say riding. So I heard that he said over the weekend that like McConnell should still be minority leader. Mm. So that's going to lead me to a dangle position because okay. if you're with McConnell, you can't, you got to yeah, leave yourself yeah, in yeah, space. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Here's a, a quote I pulled. Uh, when any party is out of power, as Republicans are now, we don't have a single leader. Trump is obviously very popular with many of our voters. But we also have other important leaders as well. <laughs> yeah, what sure. does that mean? That's, 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 that's a dangle, oh, That's baby. a dangle. That's a real dangle. Um, that's a dangle, baby. He doesn't want to <laughs> say Republicans dangle yeah. off the strain. Doesn't yeah. want to say too much too soon. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. Oh, my God. I think he's cottoning on to some of this Trump <laughs> lack of popularity. Oh, there we go. Hey, how many people have turned this off? Yeah. It's just us now. <laughs> hey, hey st stay tuned for the C block for a lot of puns. <laughs> David Axelrod is here. Little Mark Overview. Mm. Oh. Where are we going? So he's one of the little mini insurrectionists uh, <laughs> saying they should delay the vote on Senate minority majority leader, whatever it turns out to be. No, minority. There is, um, for McConnell. There is not a... There is not a he is. He has to dangle. It's in his. It is in his bones. He does not yeah. know how to ride the train. Doesn't know how to lead the train. He right. is dangling. Yeah. There's no courage he in those. No, uh, he never breaks with the five inch heels. <laughs> he wears. Um, nothing wrong with being he, short. Big chair. That's nothing. Nothing. Being short is fine. Um, he tweeted. You don't need to be strong to be a good senator. That's an we old thing. We get it. Better man. <laughs> we get it. It's unbelievable. A man of a certain height. John love it. What does height do now? Nothing. That's just, true. Just, We're all sitting anyways. Yeah. We love to sit. Sit in front of a computer. I love sitting. Tall yeah. presidents. Where are we? Stupid. What's happening? <laughs> Read the quote, Hallie. <clears throat> First, we need to make sure <laughs> that those who want to lead us are genuinely committed to fighting for the priorities and values of the working Americans. 
parentheses, of every background <laughs> who gave us big wins in states like hashtag Florida. To me, that's a DeSantis. The that's a way of, of all, that's right? a way of praising DeSantis while feigning towards suggesting a criticism of right. Trump while never actually making it. But Marco, dangle. That's a, it's that's a dangle, a 100%. Dangle. Marco yeah. Rubio he invented is the, the dangle. king of, is yeah. the king of uh, a double negative mm -hmm. to avoid saying the positive. Mm -hmm. Like this is this party cannot be in the business of being anti-working class. You know I, what I mean? He just does the... <laughs> I just want to credit Hallie for when, when she said parenthetical, she did kind of a curve with her hand. Yeah. So we right, because you can medium. visibly see me, which is why I wait. It helps me. Yeah. It's, it's on the YouTube. It's on the YouTube. It will be on YouTube. We do have a website. Um, two more. Mm -hmm. What is it even really... I just put it on here because I thought it was interesting. And this isn't even specifically about the midterms, but it's just sort of the timing of Mike Pence's ABC News interview, which drops this, oh, this about tonight. That. Yeah. <sighs> This can't be a coincidence that it's coming out now. And I'm asking you, Choo Choo, is the Trump train leaving the station? And is Mike Pence on it? And then I will read you the quote because to me, I think it's pretty like, okay. Yeah, no, he's, I think he's, he's off. He's off of it because otherwise he would have been dragged behind it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, he got off the train and then it's been a couple hours and he's looking around the station and mm -hmm. he's just a sad, lonely boy with a suitcase and his mom hasn't picked him up yet and he doesn't yeah. know what's going to happen. He, they tried to kill him on the train. They tried <laughs> right. to, it was they like a murder. Throw, on, it was throw a, Mike Pence from the yeah. train. It was yeah. murder on the <laughs> Trump train. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, a, 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 murder a, on the Mega Express. Yeah, it was a case too easy for our man, our man on the train, Hercule Poirot, <laughs> because we all know who did it. It was Trump with the noose at the Capitol. Oh my God. So the 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 clip that the ABC News released uh, is him uh, talking about January six and sort of being asked like, "What do you think about what Trump did?" And he Funk says, "Mike Pence says I turned to my daughter who was standing nearby and said." It doesn't take courage to break the law. It takes courage to uphold the law. Oh, my God. The president's God. words Ugh. were reckless. Eat shit. And he clearly <laughs> decided to be a part of their problem, adding, he endangered me and my family and everyone at the Capitol building. First of all, that is the most Mike Pence <laughs> thing I've ever fucking heard. First of all, it's, it's such a stupid way to describe an emotional, like, just say, like, he tried to fucking kill you. That's the yeah. first thing. Second of all. How can you how can you be given a layup like that and miss? It does take courage to break the law. I don't think it's good when people rob a bank, but you got to be brave. <laughs> what conservative you know what fiction I mean? writer did he turn to, to to design that little vignette? Yeah. I think he's a hero. Oh. <laughs> what, a, what a goofball. <laughs> Two sides to every like, story, I guess. I mean, you forget that the guy wasn't alone in the Capitol. He was with his kids. And he still doesn't have the guts to say anything until he's a book to roll out. Ugh, Mike Pence. I don't know stinks. if it'll be a bestseller. No, I don't he think stinks. it is. I don't think Nobody will. I will read can't it. wait for. I was at Tommy's book club. Oh, uh, uh, Tommy's, Tommy's book club. Oh, it'll be so hard to read that. Maybe uh, I'll read um, it. We have no, one more person, okay. just because I love the quote he had, and that person is Newt Gingrich. Oh, Ooh. recently floated to return as speaker by Matt Gates. Oh my goodness! Honestly, not his worst pitch, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, just on the list, <laughs> the, it makes experience. the most sense. Better than Tulsi Gabbard. Better, yeah, better than bringing yeah. a Fox News kook. <laughs> yeah, it was like Tulsi. <laughs> Actually, they're both. Yeah, Fox they're, News yeah, well, they're both the original Fox News. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. He's Fox the, News was built the, around him. Yeah, he's the Ur Fox News kook. <laughs> if you dig under this, under in like the mausoleum, the equivalent of where they'll find Cleopatra's bones, <laughs> you find New Gingrich. <laughs> um, here's the quote. I feel, and this is in re regards to the midterm results. I feel like a guy whose compass is so goofed up, I have no idea which way is north. The Republican Party wow. is goofed up. Wow. Uh, there's no better way to He's say it. It's dangling. like, yeah, you're goofed wow. up right now. That's Congrats a, on a, trying just, mushrooms. It's like a genuine dangle. Nude? Yeah, look at I that. Think, I think a I sincere think nude, dangle. I think nude is torn. Yeah, nude is a, he's a sincere dangle. He's really... He doesn't know what he doesn't know. We might be do. able What's to get Newt. He's goofed well, up. We're never going to get Newt. You don't think we could get Newt. Well, remember. We'll trade him for Henry Cuellar. If friend Liz Cheney over here begs to differ. Remember when uh, Remember when Newt did the, the TV ads about climate yeah. change on the couch? Sat with on that Pelosi. bench with Pelosi. 2005. Long time ago. He had to walk that back. Brief, brief He's like, actually, it's good. I like how I hot love and climate wet change. everything is now. <laughs> uh, but I just, uh, our, our phenomenal writer, Sarah Lazarus, wrote, um, and I just want to read this to you. Grand old party, more like goofed old party. Wow. Yeah, Sarah Lazarus, wow. thank you for wow. that. Wow. This game couldn't have ended mo Damn it. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> couldn't have ended a moment too soon. Oh, fuck. You couldn't fuck that up. Thank All right, you. everyone. Uh, Allie Kiefer, thank, thank you. you for a fantastic game. Rebecca Katz, Kip Hebert, thanks for joining us. Um, we will talk to you on Thursday. See, See y'all soon. The <laughs> <laughs> we are now offering Crooked Coffee Holiday Boxes to make gift giving easy. How about that? 
Each box is filled with full-size bags of delicious medium and dark roast coffee, plus a fun activity that isn't scrolling through Twitter. And if you buy them all, and they are great, we'll stop doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a I'm a dark roast person. Have you guys decided? I'm a medium roast person. You're medium roast? Yeah. Love Tommy's it. Tommy's like a, you a sophisticated roast? palate. <laughs> is, I, is it? It's just... I, the, every, I want everything to taste like Diet Coke. Yeah, I do. I like Diet Cokes. Every order from Crooked Coffee will support Vote Save America's Every Last Vote Fund that helps grassroots organizations get out the vote, which we still need to do in Georgia on December 6th. Uh, you can pick from three different boxes for three types of people. The extremely online box with witty magnetic poetry for your fridge, the craft lover's box with a learn to crochet kit inside, and the home baker box with the insta famous apple cider donut kit from Farmsteady that's so popular it's almost always out of stock. I can't believe I have I'm to read this. So it's glad good. you have to read this shit. Everybody buy me. the boxes. What? Just buy the boxes. You know the insta famous apple cider kit. We're uh, diversifying our revenue streams. Buy the okay. boxes. Their staff hates us. <laughs> <laughs> There's a limited quantity, so head to crooked.com slash coffee to shop before we sell out. Also, Crooked and Duolingo just released a brand new limited series podcast together hosted by audio journalist Ahmed Ali Akbar. Radio Lingo investigates all of the ways that language shapes our world and how the world shapes our language. Each episode explores a different way language plays a role in our life, from swearing to subtitles and everything in between. Listen today and subscribe to Radio Lingo wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop every Tuesday.